Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. <clears throat> we broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week as we are doing today, and it will be available for you to watch later at your convenience. Um, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Uh, for those of you who are not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. So that'd be similar to your state library. So we provide services and um, training and professional development and database uh, databases and grants to all types of libraries in the state. So you'll find shows for all types of libraries, um, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives. Um, really our only criteria is it something to do with libraries. Uh, something cool libraries are doing, something cool we think they could be doing, do book reviews, uh, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Uh, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes come on and do presentations for us about resources and services and things to the commission, but we also bring on guest speakers, and that is what we have today. Uh, returning guest speakers, yay! <laughs> uh, <laughs> Stephanie and Carson have both been on the show a couple of times before over the years, uh, talking about the uh, Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit, um, and this is a resource that some staff here at the commission have helped work on as well in the past. Uh, and um, it's an awesome resource. We share it all the time to libraries <laughs> for all sorts of uses. And um, they're going to talk about, yeah, where it's at now, new, new exciting things happening with it. Um, so I'll just hand it over to you um, both to um, fully introduce yourself and tell us all about what's happening with the toolkit. Thank you so much. If you haven't heard about the toolkit before, we feel sometimes Stephanie and I feel like everyone's heard about the toolkit, but everyone hasn't. Um, we're undergoing a third grant. That's part of our surprise announcement to tell you later today, but this has been around for a little while. It is a uh, toolkit and a broadband improvement plan. It's free, it's powerful, and it helps everyone in a library, no matter how tiny, how small, how um, under-resourced, to understand their technology, understand the advocacy that you need to have, understand uh, structures, and to make improvements. Um, so this is our, uh, you'll see this a couple of times, this is how you can download the toolkit. We want you to download the toolkit and uh, have it and share it and use it as much as you can. Yes, and so we'll have the QR code throughout. It's internet2.edu slash TGL. Um, I'm Stephanie. Um, Carson and I officially introduce ourselves in the next slide, but I want to tell you a little about, about Internet2, which got this Institute of Museum and Library Services grant. It's where I work. It is a not-for-profit organization that's actually just a huge, huge ring of fiber around the United States. Um, back in the 90s, the higher education institutions got together and said, commercial Internet's not going to cut it for us. We need something focused on research and education. So like most developed nations, um, Internet2 was created, a national research and education network. It's not just fiber, it is also a huge community where everyone comes together to solve issues together. And so with that, I am the director of the Community Anchor Program for, on the next slide. And we work with 46 different state nonprofit research and education networks like Network Nebraska to help K-12 schools, libraries, and community anchor institutions connect to Internet2. So about 20% of the libraries in the U.S. are connected to Internet2. Tons are not, though, and that's who we're focusing on with the toolkit. So I'm Stephanie. If you haven't figured that one out already, I am the director of the Community Anchor Program. I've been at Internet2 for about six years now, and um, I've worked on several IMLS grants and worked with a lot of wonderful libraries around the country. So lucky to do it. Therese Perlowski is also an integral team member of ours and program manager at Internet2. And she um, works on this as well. You might see her around. I'm Carson Block. I'm a library technology consultant and I've been uh, working in library tech since the, uh, the internet was first brought into libraries. That was my first experience uh, in working with libraries. I've been working with technology uh, ever since and um, so, 
thrilled to um, be working with Stephanie and Therese and Bonnie, who uh, is also on the call. Bonnie's my assistant on this, um, this program, this thing called the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. And look at that. It's like magic coming out of the <laughs> Toward. Um, because once you understand what's going on, you know, you've, you've seen how the trick is done. And then you can really start using it for your uh, improvements. Well, so if you haven't yet, hit the QR code and just um, peruse the toolkit, look at the table of contents while I tell you that three grants are actually going into building the toolkit. I would call it, say, Toolkit 1.0 in 2015, built the first version of the toolkit. It was about 60 pages, piloted among 60 different libraries across the United States. Um, in 2020, we thought we were going to do a couple minor tweaks to the toolkit. We ended up doubling the length of it and totally overhauling it um, with an insane resources section that I hope you will check out because it's beautiful. And we are very lucky. On the first, we just started our third grant related to the toolkit, and that is to scale the adoption of the toolkit to support tribal Native Hawaiian and Native Alaskan library staff in using it and implementing it. That's right. So. Have we said it once? Download. Download the toolkit. We're going to show you the video in a, in a little bit. Um, we did an explainer video way back at the end of the first grant, and it, it stands the test of time. So it's a really good overview, and it's something that we also want you to share with others. If, they're, if, if, if you want to talk about the toolkit, you don't have to tell them. You can just share the video uh, and share these links. But we're going to get right to the, to the meat of things right now with that video and and folks, let me know if the audio is not coming through. If it isn't, we will we will t have an alternate way of telling you this information. Yeah, let's see here. Welcome. This video is designed to give you an ultra quick overview of how to use the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. You'll be up and running in no time. The Toolkit is a free open source technology learning, diagnostic, and advocacy tool designed for public and tribal libraries in the U.S. But the Toolkit can be used just about anywhere in the world. The Toolkit will guide you through a series of questions about your technology environment and provide you with all the information you need to answer the questions. The Toolkit is an excellent way to diagnose and fix problems that you may be having with your library technology. Some libraries have found it especially useful in preparing for e-rate requests, budget cycles, and even in helping open up lines of communication between library staff and tech workers. Best of all, you do not need to be a techie to use the toolkit. While it's always helpful to have someone with technical knowledge to assist, this toolkit was piloted with more than 60 rural and tribal libraries in 11 states to ensure that it is as simple as possible for you to use. The toolkit is divided into several key sections covering the types of technical challenges you're likely to encounter in your library and ways to solve those challenges. In the technology inventory section, you'll find and understand some of the key pieces of the technology inside your library, including your network, computers, and other important technology components. This inventory will help you understand what sort of equipment you have now and provide a basis to determine if you need different or additional equipment for the future. In the Broadband Services and Activities section, the types of broadband services and applications are discussed in order to ensure that you have sufficient bandwidth to support patron and staff use of various devices and applications, both today and into the future. Did it stop or is that the oh. end? I think we did get a stop. <laughs> there are many areas where you could benefit from additional support. Technology expenses are important budget considerations. In the broadband funding section, you'll learn about several opportunities available to help provide funding for your library broadband connectivity. The topics listed in the additional resources and best practices section are designed to provide you even more insight and resources into improving your library's broadband connectivity and services. You may find these items helpful in gaining a better understanding of your broadband connection, data network, and computers. The toolkit also has a handy glossary section at the end for quick lookups of technical terms. And don't worry about completing the toolkit from end to end. It is designed to address the most common technology issues in libraries, so it does cover a lot of ground. You may need to only work through the sections that are the most important to you. 
After you've completed the toolkit, you can use another document called the Broadband Improvement Plan to create your own long-term and short-term strategies to improve your technology. Wondering how to find the toolkit materials? Everything is available at our website. The toolkit is free and open source. And if you like, you are free to use anything from the toolkit and mix it into other documents. This may be especially useful for state library organizations, rural and education networks, library consortiums, and others who would like to customize the toolkit materials. After you've used the toolkit and the broadband improvement plan, we would love to hear from you. Click on the link in the comments section of this video to share your experiences. Now, grab the toolkit and make it your own. And there we there we go. That was, um, I, and of course, I'm a proud papa about that because my <laughs> daughter, my daughter put that together when she was still in high school. Um, so this is this is really good uh, from the beginning, but it gives a good overview. Even though we have, uh, wait a this minute, is designed wait a minute. to give you an ultra quick that's, overview of how to use. That's not right. We're gonna start that again. Hold on, <laughs> just a minute. And I lost I lost my browser. No worries. So. Well, while you're Look getting that, Carson, um, yes, for everyone who has downloaded the toolkit. Let me take a peek at the table of contents because that's going to show you all the toolkit sections we're going to be going over. What we're going to do is we're just going to introduce kind of the concepts in each of them and show you how the toolkit works in that no techie has to be involved. Also, what's great about the toolkit, you can only do one section. If you're like, you know what, our computers are so old, we're just going straight to the computer end user devices. We don't even wanna mess around with anything else. But if you want a comprehensive view, you can go through it step by step. And so that's what's really great is you can scale it to your needs. Um, there are certain things that it just feels easy to start with, which is great. Um, I really wanna draw your attention to that additional resources with best, best practices section and the glossary at the back. We worked so hard for every um, resource we put in there, there were probably 10 we went through and decided not to. So we were really um, trying to curate a list that we thought would help launch libraries for success. Um, and our hope is a toolkit, a standalone document, anybody in the library staff from the IT director to the volunteer at the front desk who barely can work their cell phone, anybody can use this toolkit to learn about their broadband infrastructure. There's no technical advisor the broad, this toolkit is what's going to help you. That is correct. You are such a pro. Thank you for covering for, okay. for that. These are some of the, um, uh, the the images from the toolkit. And these are the updated images. We showed you the video from the, the um, from way back when. But everything, as Stephanie said, we had, we have double the pages in here uh, because sometimes to explain things simply, you need to spend more words, right? We need to spend a little bit more time on the on how we're describing um, uh, things. Uh, so this is what we we did. And so uh, one of the examples here, and I, I love this, is uh, a trick question we have in the toolkit is, do you how many hubs do you have? <laughs> and you're like, you shouldn't what? have any. Yes. <laughs> You shouldn't have any hubs, um, but you know it's like what's a hub? As Stephanie just said, oh, wait, what's the difference between a hub and a switch and a router? Because they can all kind of look the same, but they're actually functionally very different. And we really don't want any hubs. We want switches, and we want a rout routers, of course, doing their things. And so the toolkit gives that explanation uh, of each of these technical terms, so that there, there, it's just not a mystery to you anymore. So Stephanie, I love this slide. This is something you put together recently. <laughs> We've seen this so things. many times, too many I times. I know, I know. Some of these, let's see, I think two or three of these are actually ours and then one is a stock image. But we have seen various versions of all of this. So um, you can imagine picking up the toolkit and saying, I don't even know where the heck my internet comes into my building. I'm not a techie person. And that is where we start. Like, let's figure out where the cable is coming into your building and go there and we're going to start and we're going to start from where it comes in the wall and we're going to figure out how your internet works from end to end with a handy diagram Carson's going to show you. That's right. And spoiler alert, if your place looks like the slide on the right or the image on the right, <laughs> then the first thing, even if everything is working perfectly and everything is updated on your equipment rack, your to-do list is what's called a network cleanup. 
So this is uh, something, sometimes we take the time to draw this, but we're not gonna do that this time, but we want everyone to draw their own network diagram. You may not be familiar with network diagrams, but basically it's a, a map of showing how these end user devices that you can see at the bottom of the diagram, that's our PCs, our printers, our wireless access points, our laptops via Wi-Fi, how those are actually connected to the internet, the different st steps that they take uh, to that. And in this case, the first step is a, is a data switch, which distributes the data network throughout the library building. The next is uh, a router of some sort that will um, uh, help with traffic management because there's a lot of data traffic uh, going uh, between our devices and different resources on the internet. Right? They go everywhere. So our traffic manager is that router. There's also a broadband um, device, a unit that connects to our internet service provider. We all know, are familiar with the terms ISP or internet service provider, but we actually need a special device to connect to them so that they can communicate. And our internet service provider is really important because they are our on-ramp to the internet itself. So if you haven't thought about it, especially younger people today think Wi-Fi is the internet, there's actually these steps that we need to, to understand. Uh, once you understand this, and it's very simple, then you can under, you can be able to, to troubleshoot it uh, and to make changes and improvements. And I know you say, Stephanie and Carson, I'm not gonna look at a closet full of wires or just figure out where the wire comes into my building and then magically make a diagram. We get it, it's piece by piece. If one piece of this puzzle doesn't work, nothing works so that's why you really have to check every component because where's your problem it's your worst component right or your broken component so we break it down i like to say a modem looks like a shark fin and the router has the antenna right and those are the two ways i think of it but i'm i'm just showing this to you that it's so broken down and we actually have definitions for this and you know you might be like modem and router i just have one thing yeah sometimes they're combined but sometimes they're not and so I've talked to people who are like, oh, I just bought a modem and I didn't realize, you know what I mean? So, so there are just those little things. And so if we go to the next slide, even your cables, right? When's the last time you thought about your cabling? Probably not. You probably have a lot of cable that doesn't even work. But what kind of cable you have actually impacts your ability to deliver internet to your library anywhere. Um, so these are, kind, I think we go up to what, cat eight now, or, you know, there's a lot of different categories of cables. These are the most common right here that you're gonna see. And so, for example, we have these two cables here. Well, how am I supposed to know which one? You know, I, I if you, you know, you're gonna be able to download these slides later and you'll be able to see the little comparisons. But if we look at the category 6A cable, you know, that's kind of, the fastest, it's kind of the one, the one most people are going for. So if you go to the next slide, how are we supposed to figure out what number it is? Aha, let's look at the super tiny small writing on the cables, and you will see that the yellow cable is a 5E, and actually my white cable is a Cat8 because that was right when I started working on the toolkit, and so I tried to buy all the fanciest cables from Amazon. But so you will see that this is like actually how you check what, how, what kind of cables you have. So it's very practical how to things like this. And we have a couple more little tips and tricks, but we just wanna pepper it in so you're not just like, oh, I could have looked at the toolkit by myself. We want you to be able to go home today and actually you know, be able to make some changes or take some measurements. That's right. And even though there are different categories of cable, one thing I wanted to say is if, you, if you've looked at your cable and you're like, we don't have Cat8, we need Cat8. You don't need Cat8. There's nope. uh, there's no library in the country uh, for the work that we do that is above CAT uh, 6A right now. So these CAT 8 cables are for super high speed um, um, uh, connections. Uh, these are things that exceed um, what we what we need right now. It's something to keep an eye on because there will still be categories going forward. Uh, but if you don't if you don't have that, don't worry. <laughs> the um, it's always um, going to be something new. That's oh, yeah. right. Yeah, there's always there's always something moving and, and 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 the upgrade or the new thing is not necessarily what we need to jump to. Sometimes we do, yeah. sometimes we don't. Um, but there's more ways to learn this tool, toolkit. Uh, one is to record a shareable snapshot of your IT infrastructure. Um, this is really important when you're communicating with uh, the folks who help you with your technology. Also to prepare E-rate requests and budget cycles for folks who, who do and choose to do E-rate. Sometimes this has been a motivator because now they have a list of 
the things that they need to get. This has also helped open communication between library staff and tech workers because when you have a common vocabulary, when library people can learn a little bit more about tech language and then tech people can learn a little bit more about library lingo, wonderful things happen and we've seen that happen all the time. Um, of course, this will help you address specific problems in your library just by going through uh, certain sections uh, and help you know what sort of improvements that you need. And the best part here is that we've taken great pains that this works at the highest technical level. Like we've, we've, we've reviewed it. It's been reviewed by peers uh, in terms of working at, at, at the highest technical level, but it also works for lay people who have no technical knowledge. Best part ever. All right, so these slides actually have a little bit about each section of the toolkit, so you can explore it when you when you download the slides. If you haven't done it yet, I'm super disappointed, but that's okay. <laughs> still have time to download. The first one is a technology inventory. If you've done any any sorts of improvements in inventory or an assessment, that's really where things start. So we walk you through the, the broadband connection, network devices, wired network and power, wireless network and power, and computer and end user devices. We walk you through that so that you're able to create your own inventory and uh, understand it. Because again, it starts with a question and then we give you the resource to answer that question right there in line. All right, and then we kind of talk about your broadband services and activities. And so this is not just what you're doing right now, because we obviously want um, a, a representation of that, but we also want to ask the question of what would you do if you weren't constrained by broadband limitations, right? Just because maybe you have not great signal, not great connectivity, not fast internet in the library now, doesn't mean, you know, in the future, it's not going to happen. So blue sky, what would you do? Would you have a hotspot lending program? You know, are you doing, you know, esports for the kids, online job training? You know, do you have a kiosk for health um, appointments or different things? So it's just sky's the limit. We have a lot of links to some examples and ways to really think about it. That's right. Uh, the next is broadband technical operational support. Um, sometimes, and sometimes even boards think this, they'll say, Oh, why do we need to get more stuff? Didn't we buy that 15 years ago? <laughs> the answer is it doesn't, it's not a set and forget. You gotta, you've gotta renew that. And so um, one of the ways through that is through the technology support that you have. And we know that for different size libraries, um, there sometimes there's awesome tech support. In other cases, that tech support is laugh are, are, are laughing it is lacking um, so this walks you through some of those questions so that you understand what your technical support resources are including um, uh, the folks who can help you whether they're on your staff whether you contract for them or whether they're volunteers um, other tr uh, staff training resources for those who uh, roll up their sleeves and get jobs done and then looking at things like the ISPs um, technical support not everyone is always uh, uh, aware of those as well as service guarantees guarantees that you might have that you were not even aware of. All right, this is one of the new sections we added to this toolkit. It's one of the reasons it's such so big now, but it's building a network of support and advocating for your library. And that is because in this era of digital equity funding and infrastructure funding, um, the only way you're gonna be able to get that money is if you can make a case for your library and you have the support that you need. So this is really about walking you through some really high level questions and then it just gets more detailed but just identifying your library's unique strengths and also really laying out what does the library support ecosystem look like and where are there maybe spots that it could be filled in and so going through this section is going to help you create and execute an outreach strategy and also evaluate your efforts and that can be combined with the different sections of funding and where we're doing um you know, the inventory of everything that's really going to help you make a case for improving the technology and connection in your library. That's right. The uh, The next section is broadband and IT funding opportunities because the first question that happens when you know what you need, the next, or the, when you know what you need, the first question is, how am I gonna pay for this, right? <laughs> so this dives into that in as much detail as, as, as we're able to do, right? Um, uh, including how do you build a technology budget? 
do you have a technology budget? Some people do, some people don't. Uh, I can tell you from uh, experience that technology budget handling is different in every library. I don't think anyone does it exactly the same. So we want you to be able to find out how you're funding that and understanding that. Uh, estimating the resources that you might need. Uh, for those of you who uh, do E-rate, maximizing that E-rate funding, we don't want to leave that E-rate money on the table ever. Uh, it is uh, federal funds allocated for you as a library. So we want to make sure that you're able to um, exercise those uh, if, if that's something that you want to do. And then, of course, looking at other sources like grants and other opportunities for funding. And then we have additional resources and best practices, which is just my favorite. It's my one-stop shop for everything, libraries, connectivity, all of that fun stuff. What I love is we have a digital inclusion section, ah, chef's kiss. Um, I really like the purchasing computer software and equipment because you know, you could bang your head against the wall and go try to find the trusted resources. We wanna just give them to you so you can just pick one and go for it. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to eliminate you having to evaluate these resources and knowing that, you know, a group of people, including our advisory board, looked at these and these are good. So I want you to take solace in that. That's right. And this is a library document. So you are expecting a bibliography. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> And guess what else you're expecting? A glossary, okay? So the reason we have the glossary in here is because it is powerful. When you're trying to understand something, especially if, if there's a lot of jargon being used or presented even when you're doing your own research, um, or especially when you're communicating with someone uh, who's helping you with your technology. Uh, there's lots of ways to look this up online, but the ones that we've compiled for you, these are the most commonly uh, needed uh, search terms um, it's right there. You can take a look at it, and it's also attached to the toolkit. So as you're working through the toolkit, you can even get richer information as you come across the different topics in the toolkit itself. This is one of my favorites. This is the Broadband Improvement Plan. And so this is kind of once you go through the toolkit, whatever sections you want, this is where we're putting the gold of here are the changes we want to make, and here's why and here's how long we think they're going to, to be. And so it's separated into short-term action plans, zero to three months, and then long-term, which is longer than that. So an example of the short-term plan would be like, hey, we've got a dead spot where everyone hangs out in the library. Let's move our Wi-Fi router to a place where everyone's going to get a signal. We used our Wi-Fi stumbler that Carson and Stephanie showed us at that amazing Encompass seminar, and that's how we figured it out. And now we're gonna fix it, one month to fix to a long-term plan, um, that's something bigger, right? Maybe it takes a year. Maybe you're co contracting with an additional broadband provider to increase your broadband capacity. Um, that might take six months. So, you know, you have a little more planning going in, going into it. And also, I love um, laying out what resources you need. So, like, if we're moving the Wi-Fi router, yeah, we might need some cabling. So, you're really kind of trying to think through, like, what else goes along with this change? And you're, you want to focus on the intended results as well. We uh, we were joking before about if you know if you have a network closet that looks like that messy wiring that, <laughs> that wiring cleanup project would be your first thing, but actually that is really an important thing. Um, and some IT professionals um, um, they let those rooms get that way because that's what happens in busy places, especially mm -hmm. if there's a lot of folks coming in and out. However, if there's a problem it is hard to track down when you've got a huge mess like that. So there's a really a good reason. It's not just that it looks cool. It does look cool, but not to make it look cool, but also to make it um, uh, improve. There's also things in, in places like that that are really dangerous. Uh, these uh, cables that we use, the ethernet cables that Stephanie uh, told you about, uh, those are uh, copper wire with a solid core and they, um, you know, they don't like to bend that much. They're flexible, but they don't like to bend that much. And if you look at the, how they're plugged in sometimes, sometimes they're almost at a right angle because of the weight coming down. Now that's, that's rife for problems because each one of those cables has eight connectors inside of it. And it's tiny wire, even when it's thicker. So that can break, you have a problem, you can't fix it quickly. So that's one of the reasons in all seriousness that we don't like seeing that messy sort of 
uh, place. So we know you're interested already, you're here, but um, uh, we want you to also uh, go to our website at internet2.edu um, slash TGL for the Towards Gigabit Libraries toolkit. Um, you can join our mail list, um, uh, download the toolkit, stay up to date, um, and uh, also look at our developments as we are going forward with our new grant. So let's do our tips and takeaways, Stephanie. Yeah. So again, like we just don't want to talk at you with slides. We want to highlight some of the things we cover in our more interactive workshops and, and just things that you're going to find in the toolkit. Um, two examples of things we cover. Uh, one is conducting a speed test. I'm thinking a lot of you have conducted a speed test before, but not everyone has. We have two websites here. Um, I think the QR code goes to the UCLA speed test. Uh, speedtest.net. It's a great way to figure out what's going on in your library. Also, um, the toolkit not only tells you how to run the speed test, but why it's important, why each component of the speed test is important, because your download speed might help you, you know, download a photo quickly or a video. But if you're using Zoom, for example, you need a certain upload speed in order to transmit your image and audio properly and not have to be all choppy. So there's different um, measurements, even things like ping, where you're sending little packets or latency, which is, you know, the delay. Um, there's different ways to adjust that. So the speed test is just a really great way to do that. That's and right. Marcy has a great handout here. Yes. And so we have a special way for you to track this because one of the common complaints is the internet's slow. What does that say? <laughs> Doesn't say a lot, right? Talks about a symptom, but there could be, you know, we showed you map, that network map, there could be a lot of things uh, cr creating that slowness or that instability, or the it could be the quality of the connection um, as Stephanie walked through the different things. And so this test is, des or this worksheet is designed for you to do a test. We like you to do the test at, at, at about the same time of day, usually in the morning when you're relatively sure that there's not a lot of folks on your internet connection. Testing from the same machine, so it could be, um, it could be a laptop and your Wi-Fi network. Um, uh, the best thing if you're just connecting or, or testing your internet connection is a wired connection. Connection, uh, as close to your router as you can get and then record your measurements over a period of time and then you look at these measurements and see if there's any trends because sometimes you will see um, uh, that things are good 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 and then one day they are not good they're horrible or in the worst case you'll see things that are completely inconsistent every time you test at the same time of the day it's a different reading when you are working, and you may not be able to solve this problem yourself, but when you're working with someone who can help you, like your internet service provider or your technology folks, uh, you can you don't you won't say the internet's slow. Help me, um, because a good tech what they have to do is reproduce the problem. What you can do is say we've been testing, and this is the information that we've gathered to help you help us uh, solve our problem. So this has been an extremely effective worksheet uh, for um, troubleshooting. And that just again goes to the fact that what the toolkit is doing is bringing you this new set of language to communicate tech, right? You can speak tech once you use this toolkit. That's right. Another uh, tool that we tell you about is what's called a Wi-Fi analyzer or Wi-Fi stumbler. And this is a way to take something that's invisible and make it visible to see it. So this is an example uh, of, the, of my favorite one um, uh, that, uh, that, that I love to use. Um, and we've got others and they're all listed in the toolkit. Um, this is a, this shows what's called the spectrum, the Wi-Fi spectrum. Um, in a, a small rural area, you might only have a couple of Wi-Fi signals and so they're not a problem. Uh, if you're in an office area like I am, which is where I believe I took this screenshot, <laughs> Um, there's a billion um, signals. And so sometimes uh, things that cause problems with Wi-Fi is when there's interference between uh, one Wi-Fi access point and another. Um, so this helps spot potential problem areas. And when you spot those, uh, you're able to uh, make corrections to see if you can clear things up on your own Wi-Fi. It's also extremely interesting to see the sorts of information that's available um, just in the air if you have the right tool to look at it, including the capability, the speeds, et cetera, of this. 
you can also use this. Let's, let's just say you have no problems with interference, but let's say that you're having trouble with coverage of Wi-Fi in your library. What you can do is take this uh, stumbler, you can lock on to your Wi-Fi signal and then walk around your library to see where the signal is good or where the signal is poor. And so we've done that so many times. One time we were trying to figure out um, why the signal at, at a tribal library at the bus stop was not working well at all because inside the library it was super hot really good connectivity as soon as we walk outside the signal drops and there was a bus station outside our bus stop outside and they wanted uh, folks to be able to access library wi-fi while they were waiting for the bus well what we discovered is that signal dropped off completely as we walked outside because the walls were made of adobe and adobe is mud with a wire mesh in or a couple of wire meshes sometimes and so that was blocking that wire mesh and the mud was blocking that wi-fi signal so that helped us understand what was happening and then make a recommendation for an improvement um, to uh, to put a wi-fi access point either outside of the library or close to a window windows are not great but they're not as bad as mud uh, and wire uh, to make it better so would this analyzer thing um, also test the Wi-Fi speed? Um, or? It will tell you the capability of the equipment speed and the strength of the signal. And so the it's a, the the speed is a product of not uh, of first with the capability of the Wi-Fi access point, what it's technically able to do in terms of the speed it can deliver. And then you start factoring in two other things. One is the strength of the signal. So a weak signal is not as strong as the um, upper end of the speed capability. The other is the number of people attached to that same Wi-Fi access point. So if we have a lot of people on the same Wi-Fi access point, they are all sharing the potential performance of, of that. So it'll tell you what the, the theoretical top speed is, but the actual speed is it's better to use a speed test to see what you're actually. Right. OK. Yeah, because we had, that's, we had a suggestion in the chat. That's what I was asking about if it's speed or not. Um, Andrew Sherman, um, Sherm, who's our um, IT person here at the Library Commission. I don't know if he's worked um, with you all on things. We worked a little bit with with Holly Wold, I know. Yes. Um, it said you need to test both the wired and Wi-Fi speeds using that yes. speed test because they could be they are going to be different. And that um, is such a great getting point. What you're, yeah, you're getting what the equipment's supposed to be doing, and you're getting what you're paying for. <laughs> Yes, yes, and if everyone, if anyone has ever had to call their own internet service provider from their home, I'm sure they've said, well, you know, how far <laughs> can you hook up directly to your uh, modem and router so that we can test it, you know? So, yeah, That's wired right. and wireless are very different. Excellent. Skip, Excellent too, yeah. Now, we're going to get these slides so we can skip through the QR codes. Yes. Um, we'll talk about what's next. Next this slide. Is, this is super, super, super exciting. <laughs> so Steph, take it, unveil it. Oh. Um, we are just so thrilled um, about our new grant for the Tor Gigabit Libraries Toolkit, Tor Gigabit Libraries for Tribal Native Hawaiian and Native Alaskan Libraries. And our goal is we worked so hard, this toolkit is ready to go. We want every single library who could use it to use it, but we would also really like to create meaningful change. Um, and what we are hoping to do is build on our relationships and experiences from prior toolkit work and work to help Native Hawaiian, Native Alaskan, and other tribal libraries really implement this toolkit and make a change. That's, that's right. So we're recognizing the training needs um, for tribal Native Hawaiian and Native Alaskan libraries. There's really nearly 10 million people throughout 574 federally recognized American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian communities. Many of these have libraries, and so we, uh, sometimes if 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 you're not part of of a tribal environment or have uh, family or friends, you might not know that, but um, we do, and we want to do what we can to uh, help. Um, libraries serving these communities face some of the most daunting challenges to bridging the digital divide. In some cases, um, uh, tribes have IT departments, uh, very uh, really great ones, um, uh, who are at the top of their game. In other cases, they just don't have those resources. So we want to make sure that any uh, library um, uh, anyone actually, this is open to anyone, um, is, is able to take this and make it 
uh, work uh, because of the unique challenges. And in some of the cases, like if you haven't, depending on where you're from and where you visited, you might not think about the remoteness of Alaska, for instance, or mm -hmm. some of the, uh, and Hawaii is, has, is relatively small in its man, land mass, but it also has remote challenges, not to mention within the, what, you know, the lower 48, the continental United States, uh, we have lots of uneven uh, connectivity lots of uneven access. So we were recognizing this importance and um, seeing what we can do to help by equipping folks to be able to do things. Now, before you start this person, I just wanna to say to everyone joining us today, while this grant does focus on, you know, tribal Native Hawaiian and Native Alaskan uh, libraries, we are going to be extrapolating those trainings and some of the materials and making them available on our website to everyone. And so we don't want to say, hey, this is this is our grant. This is all we care about for the toolkit. We want everyone to use the toolkit. Please reach out to us. It's not like we won't talk to you if you're not a tribal library. That is not the case. So just before we talk about this, I wanna make sure you know that we are so open to people reaching out, to people being interested. That's right. Yeah, this is, you know, this is the, best kept secret in some cases, and it shouldn't be. It should be for, for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, our focus areas first are partnering um, uh, with uh, our different communities to bring hands-on broadband and technology training workshops. Uh, we're planning five in five different locations across the continental U.S., Alaska, and Hawaii. Uh, we want to support um, tri these tribal libraries, everything that they're doing to bridge the digital divide in their communities um, and looking at things like digital equity planning, technology skills training, funding the library infrastructure and programming uh, and not limiting just to E-rate, but, but making sure that, that uh, E-rate is included in that because it, uh, a recent, re relatively recent, in the last couple of years, FCC ruling now recognizes tribal libraries for E-rate funding. Uh, we want library staff to, to have great skills and so this is focused on that. Uh, we also are looking at native language toolkit translation and training, general toolkit awareness, of course, um, uh, for everything that we're doing, we just publish it and push it out there and anything else that comes up. Um, so uh, we'll also do some one-on-one um, -on -one toolkit visits and continue to further tailor the toolkit. Uh, even though we had that massive upgrade uh, to, the, to the toolkit with the language in it, um, time marches on, tech marches on. So we're gonna keep an eye on that and, and keep that as up to date as possible. Um, and, and we will be building on different things. Carson, I don't know if you want to just skip to the how to stay connected because sure. it's kind of covered before. You can chat, you can read in more detail if you really care. But I think what's most important is that all of our work on this grant is going to build off of the relationships and work we've done on the past two grants. And so we're very grateful to James Neal from the IMLS as well as the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums and, and other organizations that have really helped take this toolkit. And we, you know, we're, we're fortunate to present the toolkit to the FCC um, Tribal Libraries pilot program for E-Rate. And so we're hoping to reconnect with them. There's several um, library resources beyond the toolkit that might be, that are available to um, different libraries. So I just want, we wanted to share that it really is. There's a scholarship available to school librarians. There are also some really, some really great like learning resources and some other things for people. So we, uh, if this is not enough <laughs> in terms of a <laughs> webinar. You wanna hear this uh, again? Let's go. Yes. We want you to spread this if, if you have friends as well uh, that would like to be part of a live uh, presentation. I know they can catch the Encompass uh, rebroadcast on YouTube, but they might want to join live and ask some questions yeah. and be part of that. Uh, we have a registration link. For our next one is November 18th. It's kind of a general informational um, uh, webinar that we give very, very similar uh, to this. We just want to make sure to invite you to Yep. And, and truly tell your friends, if, if you know someone who might be interested, send them that link to come. And if you want to come celebrate our two-month anniversary of this session, we'll do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Bring the champagne. Um, and here's uh, here's a, another download um, link. Uh, we just want to make sure people ha are able to get at things. Um, Thank you to Bonnie Nichols for just being Johnny on the spot in the chat with all the links. I love it. Thanks, Bonnie. Yep, yep those have all been coming through to everyone. Absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you, Bonnie. So we're open to any questions or comments that you yeah. have. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions or comments, anything you want to ask more about, anything you want to see more about, type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. I am monitoring that here and we can grab those questions um, for Stephanie and Carson. Yeah, so it be, you it so can be toolkit related. It can also be like, I've got a crazy problem in my library. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if there's something you're struggling with, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. Yeah, as I said, we've had them on the show um, a couple of times before over the years as you've done new versions of the toolkit. Um, it is something we definitely uh, support here. I use it, I, mentioned, I was mentioning it earlier, but I mentioned it now um, in my E-rate training. Um, it's on my E-rate website for people. And it's in my um, workshops that I do to send people. Um, here in Nebraska, we have so many libraries that are one-person libraries, um, mm -hmm. do not have their own tech people. Um, and they need to figure out what, what is working, what is not working, what can I use E-rate for? Um, and this has definitely helped them. We also have now Andrew Sherman. Um, Sherman, for those of you here in Nebraska, is our um, IT person now in library development working with me um, to help libraries going out to libraries and um, doing tech reviews for them. And cool. uh, he's on with us right now. He said he's seen uh, one thing he mentioned earlier. He's seen a lot of old 100 megabit switches. Mm. There you go. Oh, and it's only going to be that fast then, no matter yeah. how fast everything mm. else in your network diagram is, right? <laughs> yep, yep. And I know he's also commented to me he's seen still. Um, computers, PCs from those old original Gates grants. Oh, and ouch, wow. somehow, ouch, 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 ouch. <laughs> they're still working, so they're still using them. Uh, um, yeah, so we. one of the things, Andrew, please steal this from me. Please steal this from me. When I'm presenting or when we're doing things like this, there's times that I stop, like when we're doing on-site things, and I'll say, if you have a hub in your library, get out of this presentation right now. I want you to stop and go replace that with a switch. You don't need to learn anything else. That's what you need to fix now. Um, I would, and I know, and I wanna be sensitive too to budgets because I know that in some cases, especially with a small library, there just is not a budget to replace things, but there's so much security risk with a, a PC that, that, is, that that's of that age, right? Of so, the original yeah. Gates grants. So, um, uh, and, and sometimes libraries may, may not be aware of that. And so I just wanna thank you for that, that, mm -hmm. that great work and that report from the field and just yeah. encourage you to, to help um, folks get past that because in the past, a, a, a old PC was a slow PC. Now an old PC is actually a security risk. So, yeah. Um, and he has done um, a lot of works, um, a lot of work getting people of new um, new computers, new PCs as well. Um, awesome. And he good says, job. actually says he's not seen any hubs yet, luckily. Yay, good. All right. Yeah, but lots of um, end of life gear, lots of things yes. that, you know, Microsoft and, no longer supporting it. You really shouldn't even, it, we're surprised it's still working. Yeah. <laughs> good, yeah, good. it's still blank. And just right? to ensure, I'm like, what, what I like to say is like the toolkit's not rocket science, but it just helps you lay it all out because mm -hmm. you can definitely, probably everyone here on this call can go, yeah, my equipment is like so old, it's crazy. I know that's it's a, old, yeah. That's a different thing than saying, I have four computers that are from 2012 with X, Part, you know, operating system, that's a security risk. So when you're able to, you know, lay that out, you're making the case, you're building a strong argument for why your library needs to be up to snuff when it comes to security, when it comes to technology, when it comes to serving your community's needs. Yeah, um, we've actually started adding that to our, we do library accreditation here in Nebraska. Libraries can um, apply for, to be accredited. There's a whole bunch of criteria they can meet. Um, become a credit a certain level and it's they can pick and choose which things apply to their library and just this year we did sherm did help us add in some questions that were relating to if you have end of life computers if you have um good uh, the um next generation firewalls and whatnot and they can earn points towards their accreditation if they are doing those things that's they really cool earn those points. So we're wonderful. trying to get that in you know sneak that in is these are things you should be paying attention to yeah, yeah. so <laughs> are you are you doing anything in nebraska around recycling, uh, making it easy for folks to recycle their old technology? Is there anything happening oh, there? Good question. I don't know. Um, okay. Sherm, if you have any ideas about you know, what happens to the old computers when you do, because he's gone to multiple libraries to um, uh, take care of that. Them. So yeah. uh, 
Well, I'm thinking that's an area of opportunity, and we can talk off about thing. this. Yeah. But I just yeah. even in my office because I, I collect things of all ages for the trainings that I do, you know, as part of my work. And but some yeah. stuff is, you need to we get rid of. Have, yeah, we do have things in bigger cities. Like, no, here in Lincoln, there's like you know places you can take and and whatnot. And he says that in the because we got last one thing. He says not that I know if they would have to haul them to a bigger city. Yes, to right. Somewhere where there is um places for that. Yeah. I I think that and again I think we can talk about this offsite or offline if you would like to do that. But I think exploring, especially for rural folks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, who, who don't have access to it. One of the things is you'll, you might be shocked by the bill because nobody just takes stuff anymore. There's yeah. a cost for recycling. So we just, we, we sent a few things out from my office and um, you know, the bill was like 80 bucks. And I, you know, I'm thinking about expenses around this and I don't want that to be a, a detriment to libraries who do need to kind of refresh their equipment. I know every, like a couple of times a year here in Lincoln, there is like a, a free recycling day. Like like a, one of our local oh that's great um, one of our local sure. appliance stores does it just like a couple times a year this is the one time you bring it in this weekend we'll take it from you it's a special thing otherwise yes you'll just pay you though whatever and it depends totally on yeah uh, good one, wonderful so it's out there a little bit um but we do have some questions if anybody ha anybody has any questions about things so here yes, we have a question please. about speed here um while one gigabit is ideal what is the acceptable range for public library Wi-Fi and wired upload and download speeds. The acceptable. I guess rate. that the question could be, what does the FCC think? What do we think that may yeah. be different? <laughs> that's that's correct. I I appreciate the FCC establishing standards because they're help, they're helpful in communicating to ISPs. But the the real answer to the question is, what is your demand, and is your uh, connection able to meet the demand that you have in your library? Even small libraries might have an awful lot of users. So they could have, for instance, a connection that can seem quick, like a 20 megabit, let's say a 20 megabit symmetrical connection. That means it's it's uh, the same download speed as it is the same upload speed. And, and Stephanie had explained, we want a good upload speed so that we can do things like video conferencing, right? So in some cases, um, a 20 meg might seem adequate might seem like it's pretty good uh, and that's not an uncommon speed in a, in a rural area like a pretty good speed however if you find that you have let's say that you have between your wi-fi users and your wired users in your library uh, let's say after school all of your public computers are full so let's say you've got 10 to 20 public computers and you have a bunch of patrons on wi-fi laptops and other um uh, let's say another 10 uh, on a laptop or a mobile device, I would bet that your connection is too slow to provide the performance that everyone needs for what they're doing at that time. So, uh, you know, as a, as a minimum, I would say that nothing below 20 meg symmetrical is acceptable but it's still not fast enough, right? Because we have these, these times of demand um, and that's what we wanna shoot for. And so that's what makes that question really hard to answer because it's not just a, it's a depends sort of uh, question. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I'd, start, I'd start with that baseline myself. And, and to add more, more context to that, the FCC used to define broadband as right. 25 megabits per second down, three up, it was, it's so slow, right. ridiculous. Three. Now in June of this year, they just changed it to not very much more in my opinion. It's 100 megabits per second download and upload of 20 megabits per second, which if you've ever actually done a speed test and tried to do things, I actually recorded a whole speaking engagement and it got it was too choppy at that because I think my ping was out of control and so I just had packets dropping everywhere. But the, the issue is, you know, um, the definition of broadband is still slower than what you would want at your library. But mm -hmm. the way I like to just throw that in is when I call my provider and complain about a lower speed test or something, I'll, I'll say things like, that's not even the definition of broadband, you mm -hmm. know, if it's lower than 100 over 20 and things like that. And I think that just kind of helps drive it home. And it helps make you feel more confident in making your case that, like, I'm not mm -hmm. getting what I'm paying for. Name call the FCC, absolutely. You know, the FCC yeah. says. The FCC right. has my back and <laughs> says, this is a beam of broadband, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and someone does says one of our, um, Allie, one of our librarians out in Western Nebraska says in the Panhandle, which is the Western part of Nebraska, um, the Scotts Bluff recycling plant will take electronics. 
Nice. So, um, Excellent. Good. Thanks for naming that. Yeah, so look for that place, those kind of things in your area. Is there a recycling place and contact them and see what do they take? When do they take it? If it's a particular time, if there is a cost or anything, mm -hmm. um, there could be places out there you can go to. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Good, good, good. Um, and any question about you said the, the November 18th webinar, that's basically the same presentation as today. Just another chance to ask you all questions. Yeah, and, just another chance whatever. and everyone can reach out to us. Um, please, you know, go to the website. We have an email address. We're just, we're so excited to have this opportunity to tell more people about it. Thank you for coming and giving us your time. We're so grateful. Yeah, and go take a look at the toolkit and try and you know, use it And in the next couple of months between now and November. And if you have more questions about it, you're under, not understanding something or you wanted to, you know, um, learn more about a particular section, come to the November 8th, go to their November 18th one and ask those questions, you know, take yeah. a look at if you, some part you don't understand, something you want more. Because you know, right now, today, you might not have even looked at it before. She's so like, well, I'm not even sure what to ask because I don't know what's in it because <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. That's we, have not, and we haven't said something even once in this presentation that Stephanie and I usually say. Um, okay. Printing out the toolkit is one of the best ways to use it because you can walk around with it and jot notes on it. Mm -hmm. If you're a novice and you print it out, it's a little thick. <laughs> and you might be afraid of opening the cover, which is the biggest thing. We promise you that if you open the cover, you will not be overwhelmed that it will be um, a good experience. So don't be intimidated by the thickness of it. Um, this is not like learning Latin or something <laughs> like that. So please, uh, please uh, use use the paper to print it because it'll be super useful and don't be afraid of cracking that cover. Yeah. Awesome, all right. Um, I didn't see any other questions. Anybody have any other last minute desperate questions you want to ask? Um, Oh, another tip for recycling things, I guess. Um, staples. staples will take items and um, you pay for, for a nominal fee. Okay, yeah. good. Good, good, good. Nice to look into. Nice. Thanks, Cindy. Very, very Thank good. Thank you. Yeah. Right and on. that's what's really nice when we get a group of people on, on the calls together is that people are sharing resources. So it's really mm -hmm. great. Exactly. See, yep. Right. There'll be different people that'll be on in November that you could get more ideas yeah. and talk from. Yeah, absolutely. Let me get my screen up here now again. Um, if anybody does have any desperate last minute questions you want to ask, go ahead and type them in. Um, we're almost at 11 o'clock, but that's okay. We'll go as long as it takes for you to all get your questions answered. If you have anything you want to ask right now, Stephanie or Carson. Um, but I'm just going to show you here. We did also mention, you all, you all both mentioned um, funding, that that's one part of the toolkit of where to get money, you know, funding for an E-ray is something definitely that, as I mentioned, I use this for. Um, but I wanted to also mention that um, grants, I know grants was listed on those slides as well. And this Friday, we are opening our grants for 2025. So coincidentally, this is good timing. <laughs> um, Wonderful. And actually going back to E-rate, on Thursday, the Form 470 for E-rate opens. So um, it was a little delayed this year because they're adding in Actually, E-rate hotspots is now are now available for E-rate funding. Something you all mentioned. So Thursday, the E-rate Form 470 opens up for the 2025 year. If you're interested in that, and then for here in Nebraska on Friday, we are opening our grants um, for the year. We have CE and training grants, internship grants, library improvement grants, and youth grants for excellence. The ones that you could use for anything technology related, they're talking about here, would be those library improvement grants. This is federal funding that we also get from IMLS <laughs> and some Museum and Library Services um, to provide grants to um, accredited public libraries here in Nebraska. So um, if you are a Nebraska library and you're wondering how do I pay for this, this is one way you could do that. Uh, next week's Encompass Live will be about those grants. <laughs> um, yes. So sign up for that if you want to learn more about those. So this is something that um, is coming from here, here in Nebraska. That's amazing. Um, we also have another grant that the commission has that also can get you um, the networking equipment. Uh, SHRM is, uh, we have a grant from the Medica Medical Group um, that they reached out to us, wanted to help libraries improve their broadband, and they gave us um, 60 some odd thousand dollars, I forget the exact number, wow. of funding to provide libraries to pay for the equipment, getting new equipment installed. And SHRM has already been working with libraries on using that funding this year. So um, if you're in Nebraska library, contact SHRM, 
ask about the Medica grant and that you want to upgrade your network, you want to figure it all out. Um, we still have lots of funds, he says. We still have funds, yes. Um, uh, so if you don't want to go the E-rate route, um, sometimes that can be intimidating, it does take a lot of time and work. You don't want to apply for a grant, a new grant like this. We have one already going. Contact SHRM and you could get your, um, and it's for any of that kind of physical stuff that you need to make That's your amazing. insurance, the kinds of things we're talking about um, that we um, just started getting this year. So um, I'll look for that. And if you're not from Nebraska, look in your own state for things like this. Um, there may be, library improvement grants are done by many states um, using IMLS funding. Um, there may be other resources out there. Um, you, you just never know. I actually have also a page here that I keep of grant opportunities for Nebraska libraries, but this is be for any library. Lots of different kind of grants in different places. Some of these are Nebraska specific, but other things that you can apply for, um, USDA grants, T-Mobile, um, Rural Technology Fund. There's all sorts of things. Look for different foundations. There's so many different things you can do. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing, Krista. Thank you for sharing that. So just coincidentally, you know, uh, Funding-wise, we're opening our grants this Friday, so I wanted to bring that up. <laughs> Love it. Your Definitely. timing is perfect. Do yeah. not leave that money on the table, folks. Oh, no, no. We want to give it all away. There is plenty of funding available for that one grant. If I were you, I would check into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, I don't see any more uh, questions coming in. Just lots of thank you. Very helpful. Many thanks. Oh, great. Thank well, thank you so, you so much thank for you. having us. And thanks yeah. for listening, everyone. I know it's a yeah. long time, hopefully. Not a heavy lift. That's right. <laughs> Bonnie, thanks for the help on the... Um, Amazing. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie and Carson. It's good to see you both again. Like I said, we have them on regularly talking thank about this. So, thank you, Krista. Um, take care. Yeah, whenever something new comes up, we'll have you on again. So, um, and I do have the link here to the slides as well. So if you didn't grab that yourself, when we get the recording up for everyone, I'll let you know this will be um, available. Perfect. Um, so um, that'll wrap up today's show. I'm going to show you here, uh, my little wrap up here. This is our main page for Encompass Live. If you use your search engine of choice to look for us, you'll find our main page and you'll find our archive page. These are our upcoming shows. The link to the archives is right here. The most recent show will be at the top of the page here. Um, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me by the end of the day tomorrow at the latest, you should the link should be available. Um, the recording will be available. Everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know that it's available. We'll have a link to the video on the YouTube channel and a link to the slides. Um, we also push this information out to our show's social media. We have a Facebook page. Here's our Encompass Live page. It's a reminder about today's show, meet our presenters. And here's one from last week when we announced the recording. So we'll push it out on there. We also use the Encompass Live hashtag on our um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So cool. if you're using those, you'll find reminders there as well when things are available. And Krista, I saw that you have a purchasing computers for the library from August 21st. I might have to check that out. Uh, yes, um, awesome. that was actually Sherm. Sherm, <laughs> right. man, the um, legend. Yep, because he had he'd been helping so many libraries with this, and he'd oh, well, awesome. he was actually very very concerned. Too many end of life. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. He was no, encountering that's, that's he was so going perfect. In, you know, he started out going out to help them with their network and then discovered all these old computers are still out there. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, you do that section of the toolkit, then you mm -hmm. watch this, and that's how you're getting your new computers with the grant. So yep. I think it all works together. Absolutely. Um, he's done quite a few uh, sessions for us as well. Yeah, about uh, security and your computers, um, filtering. Um, Cool. Good, good, good. Uh, yeah, and you can search our show archives here if you want to see if there has been a show on a particular topic you might be interested in. Um, you can search the full show archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want something very current. That is because this is the full show archives. I'm not going to scroll all the way down because, as you can see, it just keeps going and going and going. This is our full show archives going back to when Encompass Live first premiered, which is January 2009. Wow. So this is, what, 16 years of, yeah. All hits, no skips, yeah. right? And I've been doing this, and we have all of our recordings there. Now, so so be, just pay attention if you do watch an old show, or pay attention to the original broadcast date. Um, everything has a date. Um, some things will be great to watch, stand the test of time. You just might want to watch for historical purposes for fun. That's great. Yeah. But I mean, some, if they start telling you about the year 2000 and something might happen at the computers, don't watch that one. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but some things will become old and outdated. Resources will be um, not... Um, 
be different, might not exist anymore, links might be broken, people work at different libraries or institutions than when they presented for us. So just keep that in mind. But as libraries do, we keep things for historical purposes, and as long as we have a place to host all of our archives, which right now is our the Nebraska Library Commission's YouTube channel, we will always keep them all up for you. So um, you want to see what was going on 10 years ago? Go for it, have fun. <laughs> Uh, all right, so that'll wrap it up for today's shows. I, um, here's our upcoming shows. Um, we do do a monthly pretty sweet tech session, if you are a techie person, um, with Amanda Sweet, who is our technology innovation librarian here at the commission. This week's is being switched. It's usually the last Wednesday of the month, um, but she's away next week, so she got bumped to October 2nd. She's going to be talking about digital navigators and digital equity. Oh, and digital <laughs> navigators can be an excellent part of your toolkit team to help you get it done. Yep, so this is perfectly fits right in with today's show. Mm -hmm. So I definitely sign up for that with um, Amanda and any of our other upcoming shows we have. You see all sorts of different things. Summer readings coming up for next year. I know, you know, I know you just wrapped it up for this year, but. <laughs> um, all right, so I think that's it for today. Um, uh, someone wants to know, um, oh, publish date for the toolkit. Um, Oh, maybe when was it last officially was it published? It was the the we finalized the uh, toolkit, the the current version of the toolkit. I think it was finalized uh, the second quarter of this year. Um, okay, so 2024. Um, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, I think. Okay. Well, we had yeah, we had our, some. Our grant was done at the end of the year, so I would say yeah. January of 2024. Yeah. It, uh, that's that's correct. I was trying to think how because we we did some mm -hmm. tweaks. I guess it was the end yeah. the end of last year that we did that that final mm -hmm. or the first it was the first quarter of this year, like early in January, mm -hmm. that we did our final 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 final. <laughs> first of it. Uh, most of it was because of not of the content, maybe because of the uh, the sorts of formatting that we needed to do, so it would be easy to distribute. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the uh, the information was current as of. Uh, last year yeah and and obviously funding changes day to day mm -hmm. we tried to really kind of back the links into something that would show you something that was updated eventually so right hopefully right. you can at least figure out where you need to go if, if there's new funding so that's the current version from the previous grant and the newest grant there will then be coming coming new versions they of it speak, parts to it but what we're hoping is to really focus on applying and using the toolkit and the training what well, yeah. one thing we should say about the toolkit it's not like a website so we don't publish things that are fragile we're very deliberate about um uh, publishing things that we feel will have a, a very long shelf life so um that has we've been able to do that for the entire length of the toolkit and we mm -hmm. certainly did that for the for the most recent version yeah Perfect. All right. This is an amazing and commendable right. turnaround. Good job. Thank you so much, everybody. Right. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, yeah, so everyone. I think we will wrap it up. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, thank you. Good to see you again, uh, Stephanie and Carson. And hopefully we will see some of you on a future episode of Encompass Live. Right thank you so much. Bye-bye.